Um, well, another thing you've talked about that I've always found interesting is you, you you bring up and you speak about how we have this kind of speculative excess that's getting that's already gotten out of control, but it just keeps growing. And one of the examples of how how it's it's it, how it's nonsensical in a way is, is the, the the case of those brokers who were trading were were taking out put options on airlines and they died during 9/11. And you also mentioned when you were in Ireland when you were there recently how you spoke to people on the street and they were telling you that this is a, a great time to buy real estate. There's this speculative mentality that I think is exacerbated by a system of cheap credit and and infinitesimally small capital. Can you touch on that? And can you also talk about how? Capital itself is is, a, is connected to freedom. It's connected to sovereignty, to 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 individual power, and that's what ultimately precious metals, gold and silver, are about. Well, the um, what's been happening, you know, you have to look for the future of, of monetary policy and, and, and the future of economics. You have to look at what's happening in the casino industry because the casino industry in the last couple of decades has been very good at adopting the lessons of neurological economics and behavioral economics. When you walk into the casino and you give them your frequent player swipe card, the computers are already targeting you psychographically based on your profile and your um, habits and your foibles and your 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 you know your, your weaknesses, and they use it through things like scent. They'll know that certain scents will trigger you in certain ways. They know that, um, and they manipulate you quite heavily in this way, to guide you down the path of becoming in, you know, losing all of your money into going into debt. So this whole neurological, behavioral, economic uh, school, which is really quite new, it it's, it's totally repudiates the efficient market theory, and it repudiates pretty much 200 years of economic history, to, because the idea of the economic um, man who is efficient is we find is not true that the average person is is economically illiterate and and, and in fact attends toward um, um, uh, you know um, suicide if you will and well, maybe suicide might be a too strong word but they, they their their ability to differentiate between their short term interest and their long term interest is is virtually impossible so they they can't it's like that dog if you give your if you give your dog 40 pounds of dog food and then go away for the weekend, he'll eat himself to death. Yeah, that's true. The, 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 dog, the dog doesn't have an off switch. And humans are like this, is what we're finding, is that they just don't have the off switch. They just, they, if you give them a chance, they'll just consume to death. And you see this all the time. Look, look at the average American is, what, 300 pounds and, and has and given away all their freedoms so that they can have another beer. You know, you know I mean, you see this is a perfect example. So the casino industry is on the cutting edge. So now this is kind of spilling over into the into this online virtual world, which is now backed by billions and billions of fresh capital through this IPO pipeline that's been reopened at Goldman and J.P. Morgan and Wall Street. Right. And um, so this is now being built up in a huge way. So, and of course, the prison, um, the prison systems in that casino gulag model that you talk about, some of those are also private, and they're listed on the exchange. And they actually own, as right, you mentioned. Well, Corrections Corps of America, again, it's, you know, it's a prison company, they also own the restaurants and the hotels near the prisons. So when you go to visit your relative who's in prison, you stay in the hotel and you eat in the, in the restaurant that's owned by the prison. They use their profits to lobby Washington to pass new laws to, make, to get more people in prison. The three strikes you're out rule, three strikes you're gone rule, was lobbied by the prison industry to get more people into prison. And you got, you know, you got mass incarceration, mass incarceration. But the thing about the difference between now and the 30s and 40s when they just opened concentration camps is they've made it so that people check themselves into the concentration camp because they're seductively being wooed through the neurological finance and psychographical uh, manipulation and behavioral economics. They're wooing people to check themselves into prison, you know, as a virtual prison or, or a real prison, and, to, and, to, and then to exist in the school lag. And people are doing it by the millions. And now the, there are a few people that are figuring this out, and they are revolting, and you see revolts all over the world, all over the Mideast, North Africa, and Europe. This is the global insurrection against banker occupation that I've been talking about for five years, six years, and now it's really building a, a big head of steam because people, there are, there are people still who do not want to live in a prison. Right. People are revolting. 
And I actually want to get on that. We have to take a, a quick break here, Max. And when we get back, I want to talk about Europe and I want to talk about specifically Greece. But I do want to talk about what's going on now with Spain and, and Ireland and Portugal and some of the work you're doing there. We are talking with financial activist and TV host Max Kaiser. Max, before the break, I mentioned to our audience that I wanted to talk about the situation in Europe and specifically Greece. You were in Athens recently as part of your Hotspots series, correct? Can you tell us a little bit more about the work you did there? Yeah, I did this in Dublin and I did this in Athens. You know, I call it stand-up rage. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, <laughs> I go to a club or a venue and through uh, online, I invite people to come. And we've had fantastic turnout. Hundreds of people show up. And then I just rant for 60 minutes and then take questions. Yeah, I'd love to have been there for that. Most yeah, we're, it's going really well. So I'm, we're planning more of these. It's fun for me um, to do, and uh, and and um, it, it works out. <laughs> well, I know you have a, you have a lot of Greek um, a lot of Greek listeners and a lot of um, uh, people that f- frequent your blog, uh, maxkaiser dot com, or your website, maxkaiser dot com, that are Greek. And as you probably already know, certain aspects of the international loan agreements, aka the the bailouts from the troika, from the ECB, IMF, uh, EU combine. Um, have forced the government of Greece to concede much of its legislative, judicial, and executive powers. That's right. The uh, Papadreas, he signed off to the memorandum. Exactly. And as a result, the IMF has um, jurisdiction above and beyond the Greek constitution. Exactly. It's, it's effectively illegal what they're doing. So that's tyranny. Yeah. Right there. So that, if you don't do a regime change... Then, then you are volunteering to be in prison. Now, what, what's been your experience as someone who has come from from the outside to Greece, speaking to to Greek people there? And obviously, you're getting a, a more activist uh, group of individuals that you're seeing. But what is what is your take on on where the people stand and what they they are prepared to do at this point in time? Well, a couple of impressions that I had when I when I was in Athens. First of all, it's amazing you drive around driving around Athens. There are thousands of stores that are closed, mm-hmm. which uh, which is, I wasn't I didn't know about this. But you're just driving around, and almost one out of every two or two out of every three stores has shut down. Mm-hmm. So it's like this vast empty wasteland. You know, the, the economy is just you know really crashing. It's quite brought home quite visibly by that. But um, you know, you've got to still a level of apathy in the population because. In Greece, the track, you know, the history of, of uh, corruption is quite long, and and, and people uh, have the kind of the attitude that this is just another chapter in a long history of corruption, and they don't see that this is the uh, potentially a game changer or an end game for them. And when you try to explain it to them, you know, this is, you know, this this means losing your sovereignty effectively. They they just shrug their shoulders pretty much and say, well, you know, they've been, I've been hearing this for, for decades, you know, and, it, uh, that, and, and there's, so there's the, the level of apathy is quite high. And, you know, the lifestyle in Greece is pretty laid back, obviously. You know, the Mediterranean lifestyle, the whole Mediterranean country area there are known to be more laid back than their northern brethren. So, you know, and then you, but then you have this group of people who are in the streets and they are protesting, and um, so, um, you know, there's another round of draconian austerity measures coming, so I think that it's just the momentum is building, and the momentum is building globally, and I think it's going to start to feed off each other so that the the people in Spain and Greece and Ireland are going to start to draw strength from what's happening in North Africa and Middle East and vice versa, and so the collective angst global angst will have, you know, this network externality effect, you know, effectively to put it in economic terms, it'll have a, it'll have a, a, you know, an economy of scale will kick in. And this will uh, be the beginning of what I've been talking about for years now, is that there needs to be a much more equitable representation of the interest of everybody in a free market system. Well, the people, the people in Greece that I've spoken to, the majority of people are pretty much they pretty much believe that there's that default is inevitable um and i i agree with that as well i mean the debt is it's, it's projected something around 150 percent of gdp right now but do you think that 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 default will come from the ecb or the the troika saying okay enough's enough we're gonna we're not going to continue to use greece as a, as a conduit to bail out our banks we're just going to bail out our banks directly and let greece do whatever they want or do you think that that um, greece will elect to 
um, exit from this partnership where they're collateralizing more and more of their national assets and privatizing, similar, sim- very similar to what we saw in Argentina, right? Yeah. No, I think that the, the way it looks now, it's the Argentine, Argentina model. It'll come from the outside, mm-hmm. and the Greek government is not standing up for itself and biting the bullet and saying we have to default and we have to negotiate this, and like the Icelandic people did. You know, Icelandic people, for the most part, Said, screw you to the bankers, and it's you know I see in the in the square in Madrid over the weekend there they have the Icelandic flag waving. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I don't see this happening in Greece. It'll come from the outside, and and it'll just uh, they will fold up like a you know like a beach chair. Well, the biggest problem in Greece right now, from my perspective that I've seen, is that the there is no there is no tangible or discernible leadership movement, opposition movement. I mean, you've got a number of different parties. You've got some far right, some far left, but the only really visible thing you see is the the anarchist movement, which is not a movement really to address any problems. And I don't know really what the Greek government is prepared to do in the case that there is a externally imposed upon default where they would have to nationalize the banks pretty quickly, right, and recapitalize them with devaluating drachmas. I don't know... You know how prepared the government is, and and knowing Greek people, they're very defined, very independent people. It it would it would be a very difficult transition. I mean, if if it were to occur, which I I can't see it not happening. I mean, it's inevitable in my view, the default. But if and when that occurs, I, I would imagine that that would be a, a real big spark for for that type of revolt in across Europe, because that's a yeah. Well, you're right. They don't have a, a leader. Uh, but that's not necessarily a problem in this, you know, they didn't have a leader in Cairo or Tunis either. I mean, it was just the masses, you know, they had a flash mob. But in, in Cairo, in Egypt, who's who's effectively running the country right now? Isn't it the head of the IAEA? Yeah, they had a revolution. They replaced the leadership, and now they're deciding whether to have another revolution to replace exactly, the leadership yeah. again. Mm-hmm. So um, they're just they're – they're, and I was in Cairo, and we made a film in Cairo right. just a few weeks after the revolution. And they're very well, you know, they're prepared to just keep revolting. And they, they, the fact that they don't have a leader works to their advantage because there's nobody to wipe. There's no single point of failure. You know, there's no guy to, to take out and, and blow the revolution. You know, it's a social flash mob, technologically enabled revolution. So this is the flip side of the, of the social networking phenomenon used to push back against, you know, the banksters. But the, you, so mm-hmm. that, that model, again, can be used. It can spread throughout the globe. So, you know, in my opinion, going back to Karma Bank and the things I've been doing for the last 10 years, if all of these disparate groups in the world uh, were suddenly to, to join their many millions together and decide, for example, okay, for the next year we're going to boycott something like Coca-Cola, and they cripple that stock and they cripple that company, they would have suddenly – a chair at the table. You know, they would demonstrate that they've got some something to, to fight back with by using this uh, market savvy. Uh, you know, I've done the. You know, I've, I've looked at all these companies in terms of their vulnerability to a boycott. It turns out that Coca-Cola is the most vulnerable to a boycott of any company in the world because of the uh, multiple of sales that the company sells at a relative for every unit of, of sale. So it's trading at almost five times sales versus Exxon, which is a trading at one and a half times sales. So for every dollar you don't spend at Coke, you're you're leveraging your protest by 400 percent. 